Libertarians tend to have a great admiration for the Enlightenment thinkers of the 17th and 18th centuries. During the Enlightenment, thinkers like John Locke and Adam Smith and the Founding Fathers laid down the intellectual foundations of the world we live in today. The Enlightenment was amazing. It gave us some of the greatest minds and most essential ideas on issues like religious toleration, freedom of speech, and constitutionalism. But, at times, admiration for the distinctly Western nature of the Enlightenment can lead people to believe that free enterprise, constitutional government, and personal liberty can only be achieved through the slippery term of Western values. This West is best mentality, it often results in philosophical traditions being completely ignored. The truth is always more complex. Enlightenment thinkers didn't invent freedom. People have always thought about a freer world in every corner of the earth. People from various ethnic and religious backgrounds spanning many years have theorized about the value of freedom and how best to preserve its benefits. One thinker who challenged the idea that liberal principles are exclusively a Western phenomenon is Huang Songxi from the 17th century in China. A scholarly mind to be reckoned with, Huang was an intellectual historian, a philosopher, a scholar of Chinese thought, a historian of recent events, a conserver of scholarship. You get the idea. He was a brilliant thinker who accumulated a tremendous amount of knowledge over the course of his long life. Huang argued for a constitutional model of government designed to benefit all people, not just those in power. He also stressed the vital importance of enshrining and respecting private property rights. Living through turbulent times, Huang believed the state had to radically transform to better serve the people. Huang was born in 1610 in the Zhejiang province in China. His father, named Huang Sunsu, was a high-ranking official of the then-empowered Ming dynasty. Huang, growing up, deeply admired his father and followed in his footsteps by dedicating himself to his studies. Huang's father was well-versed in multiple philosophical views and arguments. He did not wholly subscribe to any particular school dogmatically, and instead, he drew from different traditions and different situations. And thankfully, the young Huang inherited this habit of intellectual hygiene. Thanks to his father's connections and guidance, Huang was very well educated from a very young age. Huang's father was part of what was called the Donglin Movement. This was a restored economy that became a hotbed of dissent, with the educated scholars criticizing the incompetence and greed rampant within the administration of the Chinese government. At the age of 14, Huang moved to Beijing with his father, who secured a position as a censor. However, during this time, the Dongling movement met fierce opposition from the emperor's eunuchs, who had a firm grasp on state power. By 1622, the Donglin Academy was forced to close. Huang's father was dismissed from his position in 1625, and the family packed up and returned home. However, Huang's father was then arrested for his involvement with the Donglin movement, and eventually died while being held in prison. However, before dying, Huang's father luckily introduced him to the scholar Li Sung Shao, under whom he was studying for nearly 20 years. When a new emperor took the throne two years after his father's death, the 19-year-old Huang boldly protested the death of his father at the capital city of the Ming Dynasty. He presented a petition to the court in an attempt to gain vengeance for his father's death. Although his protest did not really result in much tangible action, Huang's bravery was respected by many who had admired his commitment to his father even after death. As a result of his renown, Huang became acquainted with all different scholars and academies of his day. Respecting his father's final wishes, Huang tirelessly studied Chinese history, and by 1633 he completed a record of the Ming Dynasty. To support his family, Huang took exams to become a civil servant, but was rejected. Unable to serve in government, Huang plunged himself into the politics of his master's academy. And for the next few years, he was absorbed in his studies until a seismic shift in politics interrupted his scholarship. The ruling Ming dynasty's military and political prestige had been declining for years. By 1644, the Manchurians of the north, former vassals of the Ming dynasty, invaded, quickly overthrowing the Ming dynasty and replacing it with the Qing dynasty, which would last until 1911. The Han Chinese resented being ruled by what they believed to be foreign, uncultured barbarians. Now a man in his 30s, Huang fled to Beijing when it fell to the Manchurians, escaping to the new capital of Nanjing. After narrowly avoiding being executed by a corrupt minister, Huang was able to escape when the Manchurians captured Nanjing. He returned to his home province of Zedong and organized a volunteer militia. Remaining loyal to the remainder of the Ming dynasty, Huang conducted a guerrilla resistance against the Manchurians, 
Huang possibly traveled to Japan in an attempt to garner foreign assistance, but he was allegedly unsuccessful. Eventually, seeing the writing on the wall for the dwindling Ming forces, Huang abandoned the fight against the Qing dynasty and returned home in 1649. Although Huang was no longer resisting, he still refused the new regime's many government positions offered to him. From this point onwards, Huang dedicated the rest of his life to studying history, politics, and philosophy. During this period of extensive study, Huang wrote a wide variety of works. But still, by far the most fascinating for classical liberals and libertarians alike is Waiting for the Dawn, arguably his finest work completed in 1663. Here, Huang provided an extensive criticism of the Ming regime and a comprehensive set of proposed reforms. There's a huge amount to cover in this book, so as always, I'm picking out what I think are the big themes and best bits that libertarians ought to admire. So first things first, Huang believed that before there was any state, people lived with no acknowledgement of the common good. This situation was not an ideal state of nature, but it wasn't really complete chaos either. According to Huang, pursuing your self-interest is entirely natural. Selflessness is an admirable, but Huang deemed it to be a rare and kind of fickle virtue. Huang explains that the primary issue which plagued the old Ming regime was the excessive greed of those in power, a depressingly universal problem throughout all cultures. To rule is to take into account and balance the interests of others, and to selflessly pursue what other people desire. But Huang explains this ideal is extremely difficult because as he writes, to love ease and dislike strenuous labor has always been the natural inclination of man. Huang believes that the first ever rulers carried out their duties with extreme reluctance, knowing how difficult it would be to rule in the common interest of all. Some even tried to quit but were forced to continue. The first rulers understood that to rule correctly was an immense effort that was for the most part a pretty thankless job. But as time passed, people started to think about power differently. New rulers decided that since their reign benefited the people so much, it was perfectly justifiable to room for their own personal benefit. Like the legal plunder of Frederick Bastiat, those in power began to use the state to benefit themselves. Because of their selfishness, often their subjects were made destitute, miserable, and downtrodden on a massive scale. Concentrated power is more dangerous than a thousand arsonists. Huang explains, he who does the greatest harm in the world is none other than the prince. To reverse the damage done by generations of adopting this selfish ethos of using the state to enrich themselves, Huang believed the best solution was not to rely on personal virtue, but institutions and laws. But not just any old laws, ones that were just. But this begs the question, what is a law? Huang writes that there has not been what he calls true law since the end of the Three Dynasties over a thousand years ago. Over the last millennium, according to Huang, all rulers had cared about was preserving their dynasty, refusing to serve the people. Huang referred to the laws established after the Three Dynasties as dynastic law. But Huang said dynastic law isn't really ideal law, despite their hallowed origins. Dynastic law, Huang explained, couldn't be called true law because it was based upon a narrow and particular interest of those in power. Huang writes that what they call law represented laws for the sake of one family. So for any law to be a true law, it must conform to the dictates of what Huang calls all under heaven, or more simply, the people. In ancient times, Huang recounts that the people thought of themselves as the masters, while their ruler was kind of like the tenant. The state exists to serve the people, not vice versa. The people do not live to serve the state. For the law to have any legitimacy, the law must not favor any particular group over another. True law conforms to a higher standard of justice, best illustrated by the sage kings of the past. Laws are not legitimate simply because the state says so. If the law does not conform to a higher standard of justice and serves only the interest of some over others, it can hardly be called a true law, according to Huang. It is merely a command backed by a threat. Contemporary Confucians generally held two propositions about the nature of the law. Firstly, laws are only as good as the people who enforce their authority. And secondly, any law is legitimate if it is sanctioned by a legitimate ruler. This means that for many Confucians at the time, laws do not derive their legitimacy from morality, but from authority. Huang sharply disagreed with both of these propositions. Huang deeply admired his father and his bravery, but his death showed the young Huang the limits of virtue in a cruel world. To counter this, Huang believes that first and foremost, we need laws before we need leaders. <laughs> 
The philosopher Zunzu in the 3rd century BC wrote that there is only governance by men, not governance by law. To which Huang replied, only if there is governance by law can there be governance by men. Huang had seen how knowledgeable men like his father were ousted from government positions due to entrenched and unchecked power. We can't just rely on the whims of those in power. Self-interest is a natural occurrence in all beings. Those in power are just as likely, if not more likely, to act selfishly. The solution, then, is to put stringent checks on political power to stop any individual from dominating others. Huang did not believe in the mystical powers of divinely ordained emperor of China. What Huang called petty scholars insisted that the duty of the subject to his ruler is utter and absolute obedience. Attacking this blind state worship, he asks, could it be that heaven and earth in their all-encompassing care favor one man and one family among the millions of men and myriads of families? I think this quotation is really cool because it reminds me of a really similar line from Thomas Jefferson, who wrote that, the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs, nor a favoured few booted and spurred ready to ride them, legitimately by the grace of God. Both Jefferson and Huang, despite all of their differences, believe that nature plays no favourites. But Huang was a man of his time. He didn't want to abolish the emperorship entirely. However, he still strove to demystify the current perception of the state and revert to a kind of system in which those in power serve the people. The state is neither a quasi-divine, God-given institution that commands total obedience to the people. The relationship for Huang between the sovereign and the citizen is actually inverted. The people are the masters, the state is the tenant. Huang wrote that, in theory, the Ming Dynasty was supposed to be ruled by an emperor and supported by a court composed of ministers and civil service members. But the reality was far removed from this theory. Emperors drunk on their near unlimited authority resented and defiantly resisted any check upon their power. To secure their position, many emperors promoted civil servants who were servile, especially eunuchs, who had long been a crucial part of the Chinese government. Eunuchs tended to the emperor's household and his personal needs, which gave them immense influence as they were naturally intimate with the emperor and increasingly infringed by the administration of civil affairs. To put a check on the emperor's power, Huang argues that the previously abolished office of the Prime Minister should be revived. Huang listed three important reasons why they should bring back the position of Prime Minister. Firstly, no matter how wise or hardworking a person is, no man can rule alone. Huang writes that all under heaven could not be governed by one man alone. The world is too big for one person to even conceive of. How can one person manage the affairs of thousands, if not millions of people? Traditionally, the emperor gained his position through hereditary succession. However, Huang states that in ancient times, succession was not passed from father to son, but from worthy man to another. Just because someone's father might have been very good at a job does not mean they will automatically excel. Often those supposedly born to rule others are the least capable of doing so, and must constantly resort to violence, threats, and humiliation to get their way. While Huang never explains wholly how a prime minister will be chosen, he argues that if the prime minister held comparable power to the emperor, they will act as a buffer for poor leadership from the emperor. Lastly, by reviving the position of the prime minister, the government affirms the principle that no man should hold supreme power, and that instead, power should be divided and shared to best serve the people. Huang's reforms do not rely on high-minded moral principles. Virtue is great, but it's not always guaranteed. That's why Huang looked towards institutions that would act as bulwarks against one-person rule or tyranny. In many ways, we can actually compare what Huang was doing to the authors of the Federalist Papers. Huang's approach can be described as constitutional in its fundamental nature. As a broad idea, constitutionalism is a set of rules, principles, and norms that define the limits of government authority to avoid arbitrary despotism. In fact, Huang might be one of the first ever Chinese constitutionalists, according to some scholars. Huang was a strong advocate in favour of private property. Supposedly during ancient times there was no private property. The ancient sage kings distributed land through what was known as the well-field system. Huang writes that, in the past, land was granted by the king to the people. Therefore, such land can be called the king's land. After the sage kings, subsequent rulers no longer distributed land to the people. Now, the people acquired their land through sale and purchase. By the 2nd century BC, private property had been fully established. Because this land was purchased by the people and not granted by a king, Huang logically concluded that the land is the people's land and not the king's land. Pretty simple. For Huang, 
All land is either private or official. Official land is owned by the state and cannot be bought or sold, while private land belongs to individuals and can be bought and sold. Huang believes that private property ought to be protected since people have a moral right to keep what they own. However, he does not stop there. He goes as far to say that they are useful because property rights set limits on government power. Cleverly, Huang believed that by protecting property, it constantly reminds the emperor that they should not view the world as an enormous estate to be handed down to his descendants for their perpetual pleasure and well-being. Emperors instead ought to protect their citizens' property and know their limits. But let's be fair, not all rulers in history were selfishly trying to expropriate property. Some genuinely wished to redistribute wealth to help the destitute. And this was a hot topic in Huang's day. Limiting or equalizing the distribution of property could help relieve the poor. But Huang replied to this proposition, echoing Mencius, saying that doing even one act that is not right should not be allowed. People have a right to their property, and even if you intend to do good with their money, it is not yours to take, no matter how noble your cause is. Huang wonders, why should one needlessly make a big thing out of causing the well-to-do to suffer? So what happens to the poor in Huang's world? Well, he argued that official property held by the emperor's family and political allies ought to be given to the poor. He wanted these colossal estates, effectively stolen by a state, to be returned to the people. Huang's stellar waiting for the dawn is a reminder to rulers that in his own words, whether there is peace or disorder in the world does not depend on the rise and fall of dynasties, but upon the happiness or distress of the people. His attacks on the Ming Dynasty's inefficient and corrupt government have been called by one scholar the most compelling critique of autocratic governance that appeared in the late imperial era. Pretty impressive stuff. Under the Qing regime, Huang's ideas were too controversial to be published. But over time, sections were published, but he wasn't too popular. Hundreds of years later, Chinese intellectuals in the 19th and 20th centuries rediscovered Huang and admired him as an advocate of democratic principles and constitutional government. But one thing that I want to talk about that I think is really fascinating, in my humble opinion, is the overlap of Huang Zongzi and John Locke. Now, it's very dangerous to compare people from such vastly different cultures, but I think it's arguable that Huang and Locke have some striking resemblances. And after all, John Locke is considered the father of liberalism, and if Huang is like him, it kind of disproves that whole the Enlightenment's only in the West thing. So Locke's father was a Puritan lawyer that had served as a cavalry captain during the English Civil War, against the constant abuse of power perpetrated by King Charles. Similarly, Huang's father was quite educated as well, and struggled against the state of his day, and ended up dying for it. Both men were raised by rebels. Locke and Huang both lived through periods of great political upheaval that influenced their writings. But the similarities go even deeper than just their lives. In fact, Huang's political thought bears a striking resemblance to Locke's two treatises. In his famous treatise, Locke attacked the absolutism of Filmer, who argued in favour of the divine right of kings. Similarly, Huang was also sceptical of the claims of divinity that emperors often made throughout history. Both figures demystify the state, not as a quasi-divine entity, but instead as a set of institutions to serve the people and protect their rights. Of course, one can't discuss Locke without mentioning private property. Huang and Locke both believe that government ought to protect the institution of private property. Locke, like Huang, believed that property was once commonly owned, but then when it was mixed with people's labour, the land they appropriated, what belonged to nature, was made their own. While Huang's theory on how land becomes privately owned is not exceptionally robust, it's clear that, akin to Locke, he believes that people have a moral right to hold on to what is rightfully theirs. Huang wished to see the position of the Prime Minister reinstated to check the power of the Emperor. Locke proposed that the government ought to be composed of a legislative, executive and federative powers. This separation of powers not only allowed for a more effective government, but also one which wouldn't descend into tyranny. Lastly, both thinkers were firm adherents to the rule of law. Huang and Locke both believed that true law serves the common good and does not favour any particular group over another. There's a lot of differences between Locke and Huang, but the point still stands that there's a striking amount of similarities between the distant pair. Maybe it's because of their upbringings. Their fathers had fought against incumbent regimes, and both men lived through gruesome conflicts that resulted in regime changes. You could say that Huang is a Chinese version of Locke, but the reality is, Huang's Waiting for the Dawn was completed 20 years before Locke even wrote two treatises. Huang came first. One could easily argue to the contrary, Locke is the English version of Huang Zongzi. From a bird's eye view of history, freedom is rare. 
most of humanity has lived unfree and oppressed. Though freedom has not often been realized, there have always been people who dream of a better world. While Huang is not by any means a full-blown libertarian, his masterwork Waiting for the Dawn groped towards a world we live in today. Huang's ideal state respects the rule of law, constitutional limits on power, and protects private property, and that's a pretty liberal trio. On this podcast, I've covered a few thinkers distinctly separate from the Western tradition, people like Mencius Samotsu in China and Zeri Yacob in Ethiopia. What I've learned from reading these authors is that freedom is truly a universal goal in the heart of humanity. Wang and Adams would agree on the importance of private property, and if James Madison ever met Wang, they could discuss what institutions would best preserve an ordered liberty. At a time when the world is increasingly cosmopolitan and international, venturing beyond the usual canon thinkers is an increasingly rewarding experience. Even if philosophy departments are pretty slow to adapt to this trend. Hopefully one day, alongside thinkers like Locke, Montesquieu and the founders, Wang Song Si's Waiting for the Dawn will belong to the essential readings of every historically minded classical liberal and libertarian. Thanks Emil for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Portraits of Liberty is written and hosted by me, Paul Meany, and produced by Landry Ayers. You can also visit libertarianism.org to find more shows like this. I hope to see you next time.